So Patrick and Beat, first of all, uh, dear colleagues, good morning and it's a great pleasure to be back to this uh, beautiful city and see the friends I recognize on the floor. I missed the last year and I hope that we'll get good time this evening at least. So the question this morning is uh, something about the sepsis, which is a very complex issue, uh, maybe as uh, complex as the uh, the gut problems and maybe more complex than the goat problem. And as a clinician, so we try to understand better what we can do or maybe what we can avoid to do because maybe we kill more patients than we treat if we consider some aspects of the problem. Uh, so if you look at the so-called pre-fixed outcome or predetermination in systemic inflammatory response syndrome, First of all, this syndrome is not really specific to infection. And you can see in intensive care medicine, it's an inflammatory care medicine unit. So all of the patients you have are coming with a problem and finally they have inflammation. The issue is to know, is there any differences between the inflammation related to tissue damage, trauma, pancreatitis, or something else, or, or with the infectious diseases? And based on the infectious diseases, you should know sometimes what kind of bacteria is responsible for that, and we fail again. So finally, more than 30 to 40 persons of the patients having a shock, septic shock, which is a very, very challenging issue for us, have a relatively unknown bacteria or, or fragments of bacteria responsible for. So finally, uh, coming from the mice, we try to use molecules and strategies which finally are not working so well in human beings. So finally, inflammation is killing the patient more than infection itself, as mentioned before. And then if you look at the, all the factors which might interfere with the final results, we have a lot of them. Some of them are related to the constitution, the genes you have, the polymorphism you can have, Maybe the modifications of the polymorphism were by the epigenetic issues. The chronic diseases you can have, for example, the, the bowel, the chronic bowel disease, may change your reactivity to the infection. You can have the feeding, which might be an important issue. And if you look at the African people, uh, except of the genetic issues, they have some training for tolerization of some uh, food that we cannot tolerate well and we can do an infection and they cannot do it. You have also other problems related to the proteins which are being cloned and synthesized with your genes, but the proteins may change along the inflammation. They change their structure and then changing the structure, nitrothyroidization, for example, they change the ability to fix to the receptors or maybe they are more activating the receptors. So it's becoming a very complex issue. In addition to that, you have some metabolic modifications in the cells which finally may change your reactivity. So many people say the shock is responsible for the death because you hypoperfuse the tissues and then not providing sufficient energy to the cells, you can kill the tissue because you are uh, missing oxygen, sugar and other metabolites. This is probably not true since the cells are not really in a deficit as measured by many studies now. We know that this is a toxicity uh, uh, for the tissue and the cells particularly. The mitochondria is failing and whatever you do, giving more or less oxygen, more or less sugar, the mitochondria is not using the energy properly and then you use this energy, this oxygen for other pathways especially for the reactive oxygen spatial synthesis. So the more you give oxygen, the more you will create reactive oxygen spatials. So finally we, we do something positively for the patients which might be perhaps very negative for them. So we need to make a decision, some biomarkers, and that's probably the way that nanotechnologies can help us a lot because we are looking for several markers which might be time dependent and giving information which might be very useful at the entry. Some of those might be very useful after a couple of days if you survive, because we would like to know, for example, who is really depending or at risk of secondary infection. And there is something that we don't know yet, 
is the role of the viruses and the secondary infections related to the viruses. And we are looking now with the, uh, all the gene technology if we have some uh, motifs of the new viruses in the bloodstream of the patients when they get some kind of inflammation that we cannot explain very well. So the biomarkers might be very useful for many issues and you see we need this desperately. So if you go back to the infection, initially uh, Paul and Metziger, and this was uh, uh, developed initially by uh, Mr. Genoway, uh, showing that the inflammation can be triggered by two different pathways. One is very easy to know, and classic, this is so-called a stranger model. So you have a bacteria or infective agents which has not to be there, and you have the pathogen associated molecules there, which are recognized by your immune system, especially the innate immunity, and then you react properly with the dendritic cells having the proper receptors to the PAMs, and then creating the immature to the mature, and then these cells are presenting the antigen coming from the bacteria to the uh, lymphocytes, and then you get an adapted and, uh, and redundant uh, response to this PAMs. That's a classic view. The other one which may explain why, even after sterilization of the blood or the tissues, giving antibiotics, doing the surgery, doing your best, you still have some patients with inflammation which stay in relatively bad conditions and you don't understand because initially the bacteria is dead. So finally you need another explanation to say why the patient is still inflamed. And with this second explication came from the uh, danger model and this came from the tissue lesions which are able to create some <coughs> damage associated molecular patterns and this danger model is releasing some molecules which by itself are able to stimulate the system. If you look at the so-called damps level in septic patients, first of all it's not easy to know what are the good candidates to be DAMS and you have to fulfill a lot of conditions to be classified as a DAMS but based on that HMGB1 for example seems to be a good candidate the cat granulin seems to be a second group of molecules which might be a good candidate and maybe having this elevated you know that the tissue or the tissues have been destroyed by any reasons trauma or infection and then you release this activator of inflammation which is then maintain in these patients. So you see you can have in the story of the patients in the ICU is coming for one issue then is getting other complications secondary infections or hemorrhage and reperfusion injury whatever and each time you get a tissue damage you can get dams and then you amplify and you maintain this inflammation in the tissues. So the other issue which is very important to fix the prognosis is the age, which means your experience, which means your comorbidity, which means a lot of bad things for you not to be good to be aging. And unfortunately, <laughs> we will do it the best as we can. But if you look at this, normally in, in, in ICU, we classify the patients in terms of severity scores. And with this course, you say over this level, you have a high risk of death, below this level, you have a low risk of death. That's fine, it's easy for the clinicians. But if you look at this course, none of this course are really taking into account the pattern related to the injury itself. For example, a big trauma in a young guy, motorbiking. And the part of the comorbidity, which is very important to be considered. Here you have a young guy, a very severe injury to reach a level of uh, high severity score. That means that this injury will be difficult to reverse in itself. For the elderly people, 80 years old, having a hip arthroplasty, you can reach the same level of scoring, but of course the injury is smaller. And we cannot for the moment separate the part related to the injury itself and related to the to the, to the uh, pre-morbidity or comorbidity. And that's an important issue to classify the patients in the future to make progresses and to use adapted treatment for these patients. So the innate and constitutive view. So finally you have, of course, some genes which are supposed to be 
related to a susceptibility. So we tried to find this in many, many, many years and many papers. First of all, using the well-known proteins and then going back to the genes and coding for these proteins and trying to find some modifications in the, in the genome. This research was not really well contributive and we don't have for the moment the GYs results in human sepsis. Uh, two uh, studies are submitted to be published and uh, I cannot tell you that this is accepted yet, but hopefully we, we hope. And for the moment we have only some uh, papers made of the TNF-alpha promoter variants, TLF4 haplotypes and HLAD-R or HLAD-B variants. And this might be a hope to know who is susceptible to infection or not. So based on this mutation, of course, coming from a protein to the genes seems to be not really efficient. It's better to use the genome-wise technology, even it's not easy to find a strange response for this uh, problem of substance. So some, pe some people have claimed that you have susceptibility or maybe outcome related to modifications of the gene for the manos, the tolang, the CD14, some cytokines, and some coagulation factors, pi1 and factor 5. But this was not really confirmed. If you look at this, the different mediators or factors, the genes which have been cloned, and you see the number of studies, the ones which were finally not related to the association of uh, the outcome and the other associated with the sepsis risk, you see you have almost negative studies compared to the positive studies. So that finally means that nothing is really proven by this approach. So if you go to the uh, HLA-DR or HLA-DRB, this is a key synapse between the innate immunity and the uh, adaptive immunity. And this MH3 class 2 molecules might be an important pathway you have to look at to see if you have some abnormal alleles. And this has been done, and we just uh, sub submitted this paper showing in, uh, in, uh, in the 183 multicentric uh, septic shock patients uh, looking at the white cells if we have some modifications of the genes compositions B1, B3, B4, B5 for the HLA-DR. And what we found, just to summarize this, is to have more than B1, means B3, B4, B5, is protecting yourself, especially for B3, if you're a homozygote. And interestingly, if you look at the way the people die, the people die with multiple organ failure. And among the, the organs which are really related to the outcome, the acute kidney injury seems to be a key one. And looking at the acute kidney injury, if you look at the, uh, the, the genotyping, you see that the B4 presence is protecting yourself. In other words, the people having a high incidence of B4 are less getting acute kidney injury and they are less requiring a renal replacement therapy. So if you look at the functional view, not the constitution, you see, and this is a famous paper from Steel of Galvano showing in the healthy people in whom they injected LPS that showed nicely that you had during 2, 4, 6, uh, 9 and 24 hours modification of the gene expression. In blue, they are down-regulated, down-expressed, under-expressed, and in red, they are over-expressed. And you can see here that all of these four healthy volunteers have a common pathway or common response to the toxin. That is not a, a sick patient, but it means that at least uh, it's a common pathway. You see here, three percent of these genes among 44,000 are modified and underexpressed for most of them. And this regulation concerns both the local side bioenergy and the translational machinery. So that's an important issue for the future and it's coming to be used in uh, septic patients for diagnostic, prognostic, prognostics of nature, the recovery and the pathophysiology. I hope I finish my talk now because I finished my time. Thank you very much for your invitation.